Hi, so welcome to the March edition of the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. My name is Jess Roman, and together with Tobias Kurt and Toivo Glatz, with help from Chisato Ito and Hannah Grillmeyer, we have been organizing this monthly uh, colloquium series of talks focused on, you guessed it, epidemiology topics. I'm really excited that uh, so many of you have joined us today. Uh, we have been online for quite some time now and we're really eager to see how the audience has, has grown. So thanks for telling your friends about us as well. Just a quick announcement. If you, this is your first time at the colloquium, you can find a full schedule of our talks on our website, bemcolloquium.com. We're doing this the first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. Central European time, Berlin time. And what else did I want to say about that? We have some panelists with us today for the discussion. I just wanted to mention a, a new feature at the BEMC. When you sign up for next month's talk, we've asked um, folks who are interested in being a part of this panel for future talks to apply. We're hoping we can get some different faces up here to join us in the discussion in the talks to come, especially since we'll be online for some time, it might be nice to get a bit of diversity up here. Uh, I think everyone's sick of hearing me <laughs> ask my questions every single time. So I'd love to have some of you community members join me up here. All right, without further ado, I'm very, very excited to introduce our speaker today, Anthony Matthews. I got to know Anthony a couple of years ago and I'm really, really impressed by his work, especially uh, his work in the target trial framework, which he'll tell you a lot about today. As is our BEM tradition, I'm going to uh, give you a little overview of Anthony's academic history. So he actually started out doing a bachelor's in mathematics. Um, that was at the University of York. Then he got his master's in epidemiology in Cambridge. Am I right, Anthony? And then uh, moved on to the London School for a PhD in epidemiology and is currently at the Karolinska Institute as a postdoc um, working and teaching many epidemiology and statistics courses. And he'll tell you especially about his methodological work here today. Before we get started, one more announcement. If you have questions during the talk, please use that Q&A button in the Zoom webinar to ask your questions. We will actually try to hold all of the questions until the end. If there's something very urgent, I might um, interrupt, but we'll try to keep it for the discussion. The discussion will not be recorded. So I really encourage you to actually raise your hand during the discussion so I can unmute you and you can ask the question yourself. It will keep it a little bit more engaging uh, at the end of the day here. Okay, I think that's everything for now. So without further ado, I turn it over to Anthony. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, and yeah, and thank you for the invitation. Um, if only I could have been in Berlin at the minute, it would have been very nice. Yeah, um, but hey ho, um, here we are. Um, so yeah, so I'm, my name's Anthony um, and I'm currently at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Um, and I'm based at the unit of epidemiology um, in the Institute of Environmental Medicine. And I'm going to be talking about um, a project um, titled Comparing the Effect Estimates in Randomized Trials and Observational Studies from the Same Population. Now, I'm going to use this as a chance to talk about target trial emulation um, and in introduce some of the basic concepts. Um, I won't go into detail on this, but I will introduce some of the, the basic parts of this. Um, so apologies if anyone has taken courses on this. I know that um, Miguel Hernan has done a course at the Charité um, on this um, a couple of years ago, last year maybe, um, but I just want to make sure everyone's up to speed. So we'll introduce some basic concepts. Um, so a little bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to actually start off talking about myself a little bit and some sort of personal background because a lot of these talks, people just only talk about their work and we don't know anything about the person themselves. So I'm going to talk about myself a tiny little bit. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the background of the project. I'm going to talk a little bit about randomized trials um, and then talk about target trial emulation and introduce some of the basic concepts. And then I'm going to talk about a specific project where we compared 
the effect estimates from a randomized trial and an observational emulation of a target trial and um, that ask the same question. Then I'm going to look at what we learned and where we're going to go next. So me, who am I? Um, I'm originally, well, sorry, I'm now live in Stockholm at the minute, um, but I'm originally from the United Kingdom and I'm from a small town called Chesky Street, which is in the northeast of England, nestled between Durham, Newcastle and Sunderland. Um, if there are any cricket fans watching, then of course you'll know that Chesley Street is the home of the Riverside Cricket Ground, where Durham County play all of their cricket matches. Also host to lots of international cricket matches as well. So England come and play there a lot. So when there's England are playing cricket in Chesley Street, it's packed with people from all over the world. So it's quite an exciting time. Um, and then we have a nice lovely castle in the background and a few other nice things. So very, very briefly, just about me and where I come from. Um, so the background of the project. So I just want to, first of all, set some expectations of what I'm, what, who I am and what I'm going to be talking about and what I'm not going to, going to be talking about. So first of all, I'm not an expert in randomized trial methodology. All of my work in my relatively short career has um, so far used routinely collected data to estimate the effects of treatments, um, mainly in the areas of pharmacoepidemiology. Um, I am going to talk about a specific trial and use it as a gold standard for comparison to an observational study, but I'm not going to go into details about the methods that were used in this trial. Secondly, I'm not going to suggest that an observational study is better than a randomized trial for determining the treatments that work. Um, I know enough about the limitations of observational research to know that isn't possible. So I'm, I'm not going to make, make that suggestion at any point throughout the talk. Um, but what I am going to do is I'm going to discuss how we can design better observational studies that ask causal questions. And I'm going to do that through a comparison between an observational study and a randomized trial to identify where things can go wrong in our observational analyses and actually where things can go right as well. So I'm really going to take it back to basics somewhat. Um, I'm not going to get into detail about fancy causal inference methods, but I'm going to pick up on a few things where we need, that we need to make sure we remember when designing observational studies that ask questions about interventions. So I just want to give a little bit of a historical context to this, okay, and we'll talk about the, the history of, of randomized clinical trials. So this man is James Lind. He was a Scottish doctor and a pioneer of naval hygiene, and he carried out the first documented um, clinical trial in 1747 uh, to identify the best treatment for scurvy. And this work set some of the groundwork for the modern randomized clinical trial as it is today. The next important person we're going to look at is um, R.A. Fisher, so Ronald Fisher here. Um, in the early 20th century, the statistician Ronald Fisher popularized randomized experiments. Um, most of his work was in randomizing different agricultural techniques. Um, and he still remains a controversial figure, um, which I'm not going to get into. Um, but the methodological work that he did on randomization was, was groundbreaking at the time and added an, another layer to, to, to how we see randomized trials today, randomized control trials. Then we have randomized clinical trials. Um, this is the first randomized clinical trial in medicine um, that was published um, in 1948 in the British, British Medical Journal, journal um, titled Streptomyosin Treatment of Pulmonary Tuberculosis. And Austin Bradford Hill was an author on this paper. And since then, um, randomized clinical trials have become the main way to evaluate the clinical effectiveness and safety of medical interventions and treatments. And when a clinician wants to make, needs to make a decision about who to give a treatment to, they look for a randomized trial that can help answer the questions about its efficacy and safety within certain populations. So randomized clinical trials are now seen as the gold standard when we want to make causal inferences about the benefits and risks of clinical inter interventions. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, randomized trials help us understand if an intervention causally changes the risk of an outcome on average across a specific population. However, trials aren't always possible. Um, first of all, 
they're very expensive to carry out and conduct. Luckily, we're slowly solving this problem. Um, Sweden has become a pioneer in registry-based randomized trials um, in which the randomization module is built within a healthcare register. Um, and I'm going to pick up on this a little bit more in a few slides time because it forms the basis of some of the work that we've done. Secondly, they take a long time. So if we want to know the effect of a treatment by one year, we need to wait a year after our last patient has been recruited and randomized to know the, the one year effective treatment, the same for five years, 10 years. So we need to wait that length of time. Very hard to overcome. Thirdly, sometimes randomized trials aren't ethical. So for instance, we can't just randomize someone to start smoking because we know of the well-known dangers of starting to smoke. Um, and that wouldn't pass an ethics committee. Um, it's not even worth trying. Um, so if we want to look at the effect of smoking on some other outcome, we can't use a randomized trial to do that. And then finally, a lot of people are excluded from randomized trials, especially older people, those with comorbidities, um, and this restricts the external validity of, of the trials themselves. So in these instances, we turn to observational studies. So when we can't carry out a randomized trial, we have to use observational data to answer those questions about the interventions of interest. And that could be data that collect routinely, cohorts, et cetera. So observational studies that ask causal questions about interventions. Now, one of the main criticisms of observational studies that ask questions about interventions is the lack of randomization, which can result in confounded effect estimates. And there's lots of, it, lots of examples of high profile figures stating that confounding will always be a problem. And I agree, it potentially can always be a problem. We will never know if we have accounted for all the differences um, between the groups in a comparison of baseline. No one measure confounding is an inherent assumption we make in, in any observational study. However, the, there are several examples that show that bias in observational study comes from the design of the study rather than unmeasured confounding. Now, the example I'll link to here is um, by one of my colleagues in Boston, Barbara Dickerman, and she looks at the effects of statins on the risk of cancer. Now, for many years, observational studies had shown that statins reduced the risk of cancer, including one high profile New England Journal of Medicine paper um, in the mid to early 2000s. Um, however, randomized trials over the same period showed that statins had no effect on the risk of cancer. Many commentators suggested that this was all because of unmeasured confounding in the observational studies. However, the paper that Barbara, Barbara wrote here um, shows that through best study design, um, trials and observation study, observational studies of statins and cancer can get the same answers. So it was all because of the study design and not because of the unmeasured confounding. So problems in observational studies that ask um, questions about interventions can arise from unmeasured confounding. We can have unmeasured confounding, but also problems can arise from poorly defined causal questions. So if you want to design a study that will help a clinician make a decision, then a bad question is going to get you a bad answer. It can also arise from lack of detailed data. So do we have enough data on eligibility criteria, exposures, outcomes, confounders? If not, then we probably can't carry out the study that we want to. And finally, traditional biases, selection bias, more time bias, prevalent user bias, et cetera. So what is an observational study that asks a question about an intervention? Well, it's definitely not a study that displays disease etiology. Um, so for instance, if you have a study that looks at the association between body mass index and cardiovascular disease, then you are not asking a question about an intervention, even if you're adjusting for confounders. You're maybe trying to um, assess etiological causality, but the results are not going to help a clinician make a decision about an intervention to, to, give, to give a patient. Equally, it's definitely not a study that predicts the risk of an outcome based on one of many, many of the variables. It's not a um, clinical prediction risk study. Um, for, for example, predicting the risk of a cancer diagnosis based on, on several characteristics. However, an observational study that asks a question about an intervention is a study that compares the benefits and the harms of an intervention. 
and it will help someone make an informed decision. So going back to the example of BMI and cancer, a, question, a causal question about an intervention would be, does rapid weight loss through a specific intervention, either diet or surgery, reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease? So a lot of the work I'm currently doing is sort of trying to figure out how we can design better observational studies that ask questions about, about interventions when we can't use random or we can't carry out a randomized trial. And when we design an observational study that asks a question about an intervention, we can always think of a hypothetical randomized trial we would ideally conduct. As I said earlier, if we were able to, we would carry out the randomized trial to answer these questions. Observational analyses aren't our preferred choice, but we resort to them because we can't carry out the randomized trial. So as I said, we can always think of how we would design that trial. Um, and we call this hypothetical randomized trial the target trial. And then we can use observational data that we have available to explicitly emulate this target trial. So I'm briefly going to talk about observational emulation of target trials only for a few slides and just introduce some of the, the, the most basic simple parts. Um, people can talk about this for, about this for days, so this it, is going to be very, very brief, um, but just so we're, on, we're all on a, on a similar level. So what is an observational emulation of a target trial? Well, Essentially, it's just an observational study, okay? But it's an observational study that asks a causal question about an intervention where we can't carry out the trial that we actually want to carry out. And it's designed in the same way as a randomized trial. So the question and the analytic, analytic approach are pre-specified in a study protocol. So lots of times in observational studies, we collect data, think about the analysis, then figure out a question. But we're saying, we should specify the question and the analytic approach before you take the next step um, and, and go and analyze your data. And it also gives us a framework to properly define some of the important concepts such as time zero. And this will allow us to avoid common biases that we come across, across quite regularly, time dependent bias, prevalent user bias, et cetera. The, the target trial framework allows us to overcome some of these, these quite similarly using, using a a general framework. And I believe there's three steps to successfully emulate a target trial. First of all, define a causal question. If you have a bad question, you're going to have bad inference. As I said before, if you want to help a clinician make a decision, you need to design a question which is going to allow, allow you to get an answer to do that. Um, you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out, essentially. Um, secondly, design the protocol of the target trial to answer the question. So, i.e., we're going to design the randomized trial that we would like to undertake. And third, we're going to emulate the target trial using observational data. So, I'm going to pick up on the second part here, designing the protocol of the target trial, and just go through this step by step. So, the target trial protocol has seven steps. Okay. So the first step is the eligibility criteria. The same as you would, the same eligibility criteria as you would define in a randomized trial. Who do you want to be included in your, in your study? What are the inclusion criteria? And what are the exclusion criteria? Fairly straightforward. Um, treatment strategies of interest. Now, in my opinion, this is where, where target trial, the target trial framework comes into its own a little bit. Um, and this is where traditional observational studies are maybe less specific. We want to be very specific about the, about the treatment strategy in which we're interested in estimating the effect of. For example, we're just we're not interested in the effects of eating meat versus the effects of not eating meat. We want to know if the effect of eating, say, one piece of meat at a specific point in time versus eating no meat at that exact same specific point in time. Or we want to know the effect of continuously eating meat for a year compared to continuously not eating meat for a year. So you want to be very specific about the treatment strategies that we're interested in. And that can be translated into drug treatments and other things as well. Dietary 
um, interventions are, are very, very hard to define. Um, but it's just quite a nice example. Randomized assignment. So, of course, we can't randomize people in observational studies, but adjusting for the measured confounders can be seen as emulating randomization because the aim of adjustment is to make the two groups as comparable as possible. Um, and if we have adequately adjusted for all confounders and have no unmeasured confounding, then the risk of the outcome should be the same in each group at baseline conditional on those measured, conver measured covariates. Follow up, how long do you want to follow up people for? Fairly straightforward. Um, outcomes. Again, we want to be very specific about this. We don't want just want to say we want to estimate the effect of a treatment on heart failure, for instance. How are we going to define heart failure? Are we interested in heart failure that's diagnosed in a GP clinic? Or are we interested in heart failure that requires a hospital admission? Or all of those together, in which case we'd need a lot more data. But again, we want to be quite specific about this. Um, and this is quite important for some of the results we find in, in, towards the end of the talk. So just keep that in mind. Causal contrast, what's the causal contrast we're interested in? Do we want to look at the intention to treat effect? So the effect at one point in time, regardless of if the individual adhered to the treatment strategy or the per protocol effect. And finally, your statistical analysis plan. Now, there are lots of fancy methods for causal inference. You have IP and you have the G formula, you have lots of different methods that can be used, but your analysis can be very basic if it allows you to correctly estimate the causal contrast that you're interested in. So don't get carried away with things that are too complicated. If you can use methods which allow you to estimate what you want to, then those should be used. So we've designed a target trial. Um, we've emulated the target trial using the observational data, but we still, still don't know if we get the correct answer because we haven't carried out the RCT. So we've went through all the steps, but we haven't actually carried out the RCT that we wanted to. So we could be getting the wrong answer, right? So this is the problem. Um, target trial emulation using observational data is only successful if the results are the same as an actual randomized trial that asks the same question. If it's not possible to carry out that trial, we'll never know if we're getting the correct answer. So to understand the opportunities and limitations of using observational data to emulate a target trial, we need to compare the results of randomized trials and observational studies that ask the same question. Um, so if we carry out two studies, one trial and one observational study, then we can use the randomized trial as the gold standard. Then we can try to get the same results in an observational study that aims to ask the same question. And if we don't get the same results, we can document why we get thing, get different answers. And this is what I'm going to do. This is what we have tried to do using Swedish registers. And I'm going to talk through an example of where there was a trial that had already been carried out. And we tried to design an observational study to ask the same question and see if we could get the same answers. So comparing effect estimates in a randomized trial and an emulation of the target trial. So I'm going to start to talk about the project that we, we did here. So why is Sweden a good place to compare randomized trials and observational studies? Well, several attempts have been made to compare the results of randomized trials and observational studies. And one of the reasons that these results are hard to interpret is the trials and observational studies are mostly conducted within different populations. So the underlying population, dis population distribution of the trial and the observational study is different. Um, however, in Sweden, we, as I mentioned before, we have registry-based randomized trials. Um, just a, a quick sidetrack of what registry-based randomized trials actually are. So they are simple randomized trials in which the randomization module is embedded within a healthcare register. So when the individual is brought to hospital with an MI for a myocardial infarction, for example, in Sweden, their data would normally be collected for one of the healthcare registers, which is called Sweetheart. However, if they're eligible for a pre-specified registry-based randomized trial, um, then they are asked for informed consent 
and randomized to one of the treatment arms. And then they can be followed up within the disease registries as well. Now, this is great for comparing observational studies and trials, because if you carry out an observational study within that same disease register in which the randomization module is built, then the underlying population distribution is the same between the two studies. So this allows us to conduct a systematic comparison between the two. So the aims of our study were to compare the results of the validate randomized trial, and I'll get on to what the validate randomized trial was actually asking soon, to an observational emulation of a target trial that asked the same question. And importantly, um, we use data from the Sweetheart Register, and Sweetheart was the, um, the register in which the validate trial was embedded. So it would have the same underlying population distribution. And we're going to outline the outline the conditions under which we can get the same answers in the trial and the observational study. And we're also going to identify why and where we get different answers. So the randomized trial was called validate. Um, so we're going to use the results of validate as the gold standard, and we're going to assume no bias in the validate study. So that's an assumption I just want to make clear at this point in time. So what did validate do? So Validate recruited individuals who were 18 years or older, had a myocardial infarction, underwent percutaneous coronary intervention, gave informed consent, and there were a few other eligibility criteria. And all of these individuals were identified within the Sweetheart Healthcare Register. And the treatment strategies of interest were two anticoagulant treatments that are given under PCI, bivalirudin and heparin. The patients were randomized, and they were looking at the comparative effect of bivalirudin or heparin on death, MI, and bleeding, and a composite of these by 180 days. The investigators looked at the intention to treat effect, and they used Kaplan-Meier plots and Cox regression to analyze the data. Just another different way to look at how validate was, was designed, those with a myocardial infarction, so a STEMI or a non-STEMI, underwent coronary angi angiography, at which point their details are normally registered within the Sweetheart Register. If they were eligible for the trial, they were randomized to either heparin or bibliorudin, at which point they underwent PCI, and they were followed up at one week or six months, 180 days, by phone calls by the nurse and within the clinical registers to look at death, myocardial infarction, and bleeding. So quickly, some of the results. So this is the, uh, these are the cumulative incidence curves. And we see that generally there's no difference in risk of all outcomes between the two treatment arms throughout follow-up. Um, there's a small divergence um, in the risk of myocardial infarction. Um, but if we look at the average hazard ratios over 180 days, we see that there's no evidence of a difference in the risk of any of the outcomes between those given bibliorudin or heparin. So, no effect between the two treatments, basically, is other results of the study of the validate trial. So we're now going to talk about in the target trial that we designed, which attempted to answer the same question as the validate trial. Okay. So I've mentioned Sweetheart a few times before. These are the data that we used. Um, a little bit of detail about what Sweetheart actually is. Um, it's a quality register for patients hospitalized with acute coronary syndromes or undergoing coronary or valvular interventions. And it collects data from all of the hospitals in Sweden that provide these services. So for example, it collects detailed clinical data when people are admitted to hospital with a myocardial infarction. And these data are linked to other registers, such as the patient register, which collects inpatients and, and outpatient records, and the cause of death register, why people have died, prescribed drug register, all the drugs that have been dispensed across Sweden and pharmacies, and, and a few other registers. So the protocol of our target trial, just to remind you, we're trying to ask, ask the same question as the validate trial um, was asking. So our eligibility criteria was the same as validate, basically, with, with six exceptions. Um, I'm going to pick up on the most important ones here. So the first, first of all, our study period 
was different to that other validate trial. Because during the period of that validate trial, everyone who was in the healthcare register and were eligible for the trial and gave informed consent um, were randomized to one of the treatments. And we wanted to look at the treatments under normal clinical practice, not when they'd been randomized. So we used a study period of January 2012 to May 2014, whereas the validate trial started in June 2014. So we used a period before the actual randomized trial itself. Um, we weren't able to ask for informed consent. Okay, so in the validate trial itself, I think around 30 or 35% of those who were eligible didn't give informed consent to be included. We weren't able to exclude the people who otherwise um, would not have given informed consent. Um, we also weren't able to match a few eligibility criteria due to not having detailed enough data within the sweetheart register. So for instance, we weren't able to um, identify contraindications to the study medication and a few other reasons for not, not being able to have, a few other reasons that we didn't have detailed enough data, a few of the small eligibility criteria we weren't able to emulate. But all of this was identified within Sweetheart. Our treatment strategies of interest were the same. So the anticoagulant treatments, bibliorudin and heparin. Um, we assumed that um, the assignment was exchangeable, conditional on our measure confounders. So the confounders that we identified were important were severity of myocardial infarction, center where PCI took place, the demographics, some lab measurements, blood pressure, heart rate, previous diagnoses of things such as diabetes, other medications that the patients were given um, and prior cardiovascular disease. Um, our outcomes were the same, death, MI, bleeding, and a composite of all of these. However, we're only going to focus on the death, MI, and bleeding for the purpose of this, which will, be, will become clear why we did that soon. We followed up until 180 days, and we were interested in the intention to treat effect, and we used couple of my plots and inverse probability weighting to adjust for confounding. So quick look at some of the baseline characteristics of our target trial emulation, of our observational study. And um, we see that around two and a half thousand individuals were in each treatment arm. And there were a similar proportion of females, similar ages, most characteristics were balanced, apart from a very high proportion of those given bibliorudin had a STEMI compared to a non-STEMI. But very few of those who were given heparin had a STEMI compared to a non-STEMI. So what this tells us is that um, those who were given bibliorudin had more severe myocardial infarctions in the period before the validate trial. And this is something we need to be aware of when we interpret the results um, in the future. So we're looking at the, the risk here, the cumulative incidence of all of the outcomes by 180 days. So just to get you acquainted, um, we have the risk of all of the individual outcomes here. And we have the, the risk by 180 days in the bibliorudin arm, oh, bibliorudin arm, and the risk in the heparin arm. And we have the results of our observational target trial and the results of the actual validate randomized trial itself. So for the death and myocardial infarction outcomes, we see that the risk in our target trial is consistently slightly higher than the results of the validate randomized trial. Um, sometimes the trial result is within our random error, sometimes not. Now this is a fully expected result. Um, if you remember back, one of the main differences in the eligibility criteria between our target trial and the actual randomized trial um, was that we could not ask for informed consent. So therefore we included people who were slightly older, had some more comorbidities, essentially were at high risk of outcomes such as death and myocardial infarction. So this slightly higher risk of death and myocardial infarction in our observational study is explainable and understandable. However, something that we weren't expecting um, was this result for bleeding. So we see that the risk of bleeding is consistently, quite considerably lower in our target trial compared with the actual trial itself. So we have a risk of bleeding of 8.6% in the bibliorudin arm in the randomized trial and 3.2% in our observational study. So after some thinking, remember that actually in the validate trial, they captured some of the outcomes through registers, but also through phone calls. Okay, so they, they called the form 
the study participants up as well as looking in the registers to, to, to see to see the outcomes and we could only use registers we couldn't phone the, the patients up okay the trial could therefore capture less severe cases of bleeding therefore we're actually defining a different outcome in the observational study to what they to the outcome they defined in the trial validate measured bleeding recorded in hospitals and at home whereas we only measured bleeding that required hospital care we did a sensitivity analysis where we try to expand the definition of bleeding and sort of capture less severe cases of bleeding but this made a minimal difference so this brings us to lesson one what we've learned we can't use observational data to accurately define a bleeding outcome similar to validate now this is a very actually very very simple message don't try to fit square pegs into round holes like this baby is doing here and um, if we can't define the outcome that we want to we're going to get incorrect answers and this is important for a wider perspective as well so when we look at results in meta-analyses that include both trial and observational um, studies if they're estimating the effect on different outcomes then they're likely to get different answers so what we're saying is if you don't have the data to define what you want to don't try to do it so um i now want to look at the relative risk of all of the outcomes in both treatment arms by 180 days first of all we're going to get rid of that bleeding outcome because we're defining a different outcome in our study compared to the randomized trial itself so we'll get rid of that um, so now focusing on death and myocardial infarction we see that even though the point estimates are slightly different both the randomized trial and the observational study our target trial conclude that there's no difference in the risk of death or myocardial myocardial infarction between the treatment groups by 180 days um, so yeah no difference in the risk of death in mi by 180 days in those given bibliorudin or heparin in both the validate randomized trial and our observational target trial however i want to look into this a little bit closer so these are the unadjusted survival curves okay so if we look at the un unadjusted survival curve for myocardial infarction first we see that there's an over, mainly an overlap throughout treatment, some slight divergence towards the end, but there's not much confounding in that in the, for the myocardial infarction outcome. Whereas we, if we look at the unadjusted survival curve for death, we see that there's an acute increased risk of death in this bivalirudin group early in follow-up, which is likely driven by a higher proportion of those given bivalirudin having a more severe myocardial infarction so having a STEMI rather than a non-STEMI okay so then we try to adjust for these differences um, through inverse probability weighting now these are the survival curves weighted for differences in the baseline confounders using inverse probability weights again looking at the the MI survival curves there's an overlap so we see no difference in the effect of treatment throughout the whole period of follow-up but what we see in the death plot is that even after adjustment, um, we don't account for all the difference in the risk of death early in follow-up. This means that if we try to estimate the short-term risk difference um, of death between the two treatment groups at say 14 days, we found it, find an increased risk in the bivalirudin group. And I believe the risk ratio is around 1.8, 1.9. Now, this wasn't found in the trial at all. They found no difference in the risk of death throughout the whole of follow-up. Um, we were therefore unable to account for confounding that happens very shortly after follow-up, but our adjustment was adequate to account for confounding over longer follow-up. And as I said, we believe that this difference is because the target in the target trial, those that given bivalirudin were more likely to be diagnosed with STEMI, more severe myocardial infarctions, and we just can't fully account for this difference statistically. That's just the, the graph by itself. I'll skip on that. So lesson two, we can't estimate the short-term effects as we can't accurately control for confounding immediately after the start of follow-up. So there's still the separation of survival curves even after adjustment. Um, 
So what this shows is, is though even that you might be able to estimate the long-term effect, don't always assume that you can accurately estimate the effect of treatment at other points in time. In this case, we have intractable confounding early in, early in follow-up, but this doesn't manifest in notice, noticeable confounding later in follow-up. So given the measure confounders you have, you might only be able to estimate an accurate effect of treatment for a given period of time. So what have we learned? So first of all, we've learned that confounding isn't always the problem, okay? Although many people say that differences between randomized controlled trials and observational studies always arise because of unmeasured confounding, this isn't always the case. Again, it might sound basic, but it's an important point to think about. Are we capturing the outcome we intend to capture? And does this allow a valid comparison to other studies? So if we have the incorrect outcome definition, we're likely to get incorrect results, which is what we found for our bleeding outcome here. However, confounding sometimes is the problem. So confounding early in follow-up may mean we can't accurately, accurately estimate short-term effects of treatment. But over longer follow-up, this confounding may be negligible. So as you mentioned before, we might be able to estimate the effect of treatment in observational study over a long period of time, but this doesn't always translate into being able to estimate it accurately over every period of time. And this is important, and it emphasizes that our causal question should be clear about the length of time we're interested in, okay? But actually, we can get the same results in trials and observational studies. We found the same results of the comparative effect of bifidoludin and heparin on death and myocardial infarction by 180 days. And we did this through close harmonization of protocols, so we emulated a target trial that was similar to the to the validate trial itself. We had high quality data, so Sweetheart includes some of the most complete data for patients undergoing PCI um, worldwide, and that data that we had was quite similar to the data that they had available in the trial, with some exceptions. We were able to adjust for important confounders, and we used appropriate analytic methods. But we did have some limitations. So first of all, as I mentioned, we assume that the validate trial is free of bias. So an, an inherent assumption of this work is that validate is correct and is not biased. Um, if it was wrong for some reason, then our observational emulation is trying to recreate results that are incorrect. Um, however, I have confidence that validate is correct. Um, it's a simple randomized trial with only two treatment arms little loss to follow up because they can capture most of the outcomes in registers and the follow-up is, is, is fairly short so I'm quite confident that those results are correct. Secondly, Sweetheart didn't include some of the required observational data. So the Sweetheart register didn't include some of the information on eligibility criteria and some of the information on outcomes which is one of our main findings. So we weren't actually able to get the same information as they had in the trial. So as I said before, Sweetheart can contain some of the most complete routinely collected data worldwide for individuals undergoing PCI. But what I'm trying to say is that we're likely never going to be able to get the same level of detail from observational data as we do when we carry out a randomized trial. So this is something we always need to think about. And finally, this is only one specific clinical situation, and it might not be the case for other questions, but it does help us identify some important places where the observational emulation of a target trial can fail. So where are we going next? Um, so our plans from here is we, we basically need more direct comparisons of randomized trials and observational emulations of target trials. As I said before, the example I presented is only one specific clinical situation. So there could be different pro problems that arise from different clinical situations. And doing this a few more times will allow us to understand where observational emulations fail. We're actually um, undertaking another project at the minute, looking at a trial that estimated the effect of thrombus aspiration on death and seeing where we can get the same answer using the observational data and where, where our emulation fails. <clears throat> 
We're also interested to know if we can use the short-term trial data and long-term observational data together. And if we were able to do this, then we could quickly and efficiently estimate the long-term effects of interventions. And we're looking to, to do this through use of methods of transportability and benchmarking. Um, and which is just something we're starting to, to look at at the minute using the same data. So thank you to the study team, um, Miguel Hanan from Harvard School of Public Health, Issa de Hebra from Brown, Anita Berglund and Maria Fayeting from KI, IMM, and the team at Sweetheart. And finally, thank you to you, everyone, for listening to me for the past 45 minutes. Um, if you want to contact me, this is my email address. Um, I'm, it's always open. You can follow me on Twitter and all of the analysis code for this project is on my GitHub page as well. So you can, you can have a look at that in my great coding if, if, if you want to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Anthony, so much for joining us. I'm just going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll move into the discussion.